to order at 601. And um, as we call it, we do, would like to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. And um, Jeff, would you lead us to it? I pledge allegiance to the United States of America, one nation, under God, liberty and justice for all. Thank you all very much. We'll call the board members. All are present and accounted for. As my fellow board members look at the agenda, is there a need for any additions, deletions, or corrections? No. All right. Well, with that, uh, we'll approve the agenda. If I could get a motion to approve tonight's agenda. A motion to approve tonight's agenda. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Next item, we will review and approve the November 2020 regular meeting minutes. There was one note, uh, Melissa, on citizens' issues, item number six. Sorry, I know that you're no, dual had to to the rolling. Back and forth. Back and forth. On, on that, um, the, it reads, Ford was informed that the developer from the bike park is still including um, Elk Creek as a partner in their prom in the promotional materials, um, but it doesn't say that we are against it. Well, okay. If we could just yep. add that um, that that was not anything that had been approved. Okay. Or however she sure. would like to phrase it. Absolutely. Agree with that. Any other necessary changes or corrections? All right. Seeing none, if we could get a motion to approve the regular meeting minutes with the addition. I would the minutes from the November 10th meeting with the addition of clarifying language that ECFP does not, you know, area is not collaborating with the bike park, which I think is the language they are using. Yes. Um, with that correction, they remove the minutes. And a second, please. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. And that will take us to Director Woods, Financial Matters. Speak where do you have the presentation? We are having a technical difficulties. Okay. So our screens are not working. So our screen isn't working. Okay. And I didn't bring my laptop. So we'll just have to go with my notes. Pretend there's a graph up here of revenue. Okay. Year to date revenue is I can read my notes. Is it three million? 754 and some change against a budget of 3 million eight. We're at 99% of our total revenue budget at this point. So we are expecting very close to our total revenue budget. More technical difficulties? Uh, no, that was somebody who wasn't muted. I oh, muted. okay. So some of the contributors to, to revenue for November um, is a couple of good news, bad news. Uh, surf revenues are reimbursements are tapering off, which is good news because that means there's less fires. Right? So that is part of the trajectory, a little bit of a drop in terms of where we were going. Ownership taxes continue to track favorably with an uptick in November. People are still buying the cars, I guess. Interest income comes close to track variable each month. One of the advantages of 
interest rates being up is we are actually getting more interest income for 2022 than we got in 2021. So that is good news. Lease revenue will come in a little bit over budget. We had one little bump this month of $5,400 from the proceeds of the big chili cookoff. So that went into donations. How much was that again, Sharon? Five thousand four hundred dollars. A lot of chili. A lot of chili. Yes. Expenses. Expenses are still tracking below projected expenses. We we're looking at the total year-to-date budget. Um, we're about at sixty-nine percent of the year-to-date budget for expenses, and we're about ninety-two percent through the year. So we're almost done with the year. We will come in under budget with expenses this year. Some of the Contributors to that would be legal services. We basically didn't have to pay for everything that had to do with foothills because um, the insurance company picked up a lot of that. Human resources, we didn't hire anyone for human resources. Barbara's doing double duty. I don't think she's getting double pay. <laughs> so that is actually coming in under budget. Um, Overall salaries are about 55% of budgets. Training is one that's still well below. We did hire a training captain. Well, we actually promoted to a training captain. Is that the right? Correct, yeah. Okay, yep. making sure. Um, this He doesn't really doesn't start till the end of November, so we won't see that uptick in training until December when he actually gets paid. Um, prevention, we bill 50% to in a canyon, and again, that's still under budget. Surf overall expenses are at about 75% of what was budgeted. And the other good news is we received 39,000 insurance check for 2015 Typhoon. Correct. What is the Typhoon? That's a very fancy name for a fire engine. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> That is marketing hyperbole. Uh, to, to date, we, we had a hiccup with a command light on top of the truck. Uh, um, it was damaged, and it was repaired. Good. That's what that's for. Good. That's what the checks for. Yeah. So that actually went into capital expenditures, but, you know, it was overall good news. Um, we saw a bump in EMS expenses, uh, volunteer Contribution, volunteer pension contribution, software update, upgrade, and a couple other miscellaneous things. If anybody has any questions, raise your hand. Net income so far in 2022 is better than 2021. We are at about 1.76 million in bottom line revenue for 2022. And so it's still, it's, it's coming down because we don't have the property taxes coming in in December that we had earlier in the year. So it, it trajectory coming down, but we'll be over our budget up to 10 million and some change. But there's other numbers that go into that. Property tax revenue is our biggest revenue. It's a greater than 60% of overall revenue. So it's the biggest number on the revenue line. We really can't get much closer to budget than we are. We're at 3.7 million actual versus 3.7 million budget. There are 11,000 apart. So we did a pretty darn good job of doing the budget. Yes, yes. Um, property tax revenue did drop again from October to November, but again, it's still at about 99% of its projected revenue number for. 2022. We analyze labor three different ways. We look at labor adjusted for what we bill inter canyon, and we bill them 100% for field services, prevention services 50%, and maintenance 50%. So the part, the graph that I'm looking at, that nobody else is looking at, basically says that we are looking at about 2.547 million actual labor adjusted for the stuff we bill out against a budget of 2.863 million. So we're about 80% of our expense budget for labor for this year, including what we bill out. 
So that's also good news contributing to the good news in terms of what we'll be able to add to reserves. Next way we look at labor is we adjust it for the build amounts and we'll take surf labor out. Surf labor is part of what is billed to the state for out of district fires. And when we take surf revenue out, since it is pretty far under budget at this point, we are at 86% of our of our expense budget. So we're at 2.1 million versus 2.5 million in action. So we're about 41,000 less than that adjusted budget number. There are some things we're going to talk about when we get to uh, the next labor budget number. So surf labor, we're at 539,000 versus a budget of 858,000. So they're at 63% of the budget. If we look at overall labor, including surf, we're more under budget than when you look at it without surf. There were some things in November that were different than earlier in the year. Part of the policy at the fire department is that if you don't take all of your PTO, personal time off, you can actually get it paid out. So we saw a little bit of a bump in labor expenses in the month of November because there were a number of employees that asked to be paid for their time off. And that, that's a pretty standard sort of thing is um, if you don't take the time off, policy says you can get paid for it. So that was part of the little bit of a bump we saw in labor in November. Surf reimbursement status. At this point, we have billed the state of Colorado one million two seventy one four thirty nine. There's one. There was one more fire in November that we actually billed the state for, but it's been pretty quiet. <coughs> there was a high of about a hundred and I think thirty one thousand or thirty two thousand in the month of July. And some of it has tapered off a bit as the fires have tapered off. Our average day from reimbursement, from, I'm sorry, from submittal to reimbursement is 40 days. Last month, the average was 41 days. Last year, it was 63 days. So we are actually getting reimbursed for our surf expenses on a much more timely basis. And that's because Barbara and Beth have been really keeping on top of that. The overall surf expenses are 818,000. That includes wages and operational. Just in case anyone's interested, the million 271 that we have billed the state, 43% of that was for fires in Texas. That was 528,000 that was submitted and been paid. The only thing that hasn't been paid is the one in November. In New Mexico, 238,000. Idaho, 167,000. Alaska, 63,000. Washington State, 51,000. Oregon, 50,000. Nebraska, 49,000. Colorado came in eighth at 44,000. And then we have a smattering of Arizona, Utah, Nevada, and Wyoming making up the rest of the bills that were presented to the state. And questions? I'm sorry we don't have graphs, but they're really pretty. You want to come look at them? That's what I'm doing right now. Okay. No more questions. November expenses. Actual expenses were $272,108.78. So I'd like a motion to approve the November expenses. I move to approve the expenditure of two hundred seventy thousand one hundred and eight thousand seventy eight cents. Thanks, Joe. Second. <laughs> all in favor. Aye. 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 All right. That motion passes. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you, Director Woods. Um, again, your your insight into our plans is 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 appreciated. These numbers. Yeah. This numbers that they have not been presented that way. They yeah. tell a story. They, they tell a story. Yeah. Maybe. All right. Um, that moves us into Chief Ware's report. 
All right. So we had uh, we participated in the uh, kind of Christmas parade. Hopefully, everybody came out. It was a tremendous success. Wanted to uh, thank Heather Quisnar from the sport team, Chief Aronson, Lieutenant Devaney, Jason Papenthus, and the community ambassadors. Uh, the individuals is they made the difference in this event being a success. We had some challenges because we had an EMT class, so a lot of our very active individuals were uh, in the EMT class, but it worked out. So thanks to those guys as well as the community ambassadors. It, it worked. Uh, we also had a great month for training. We had an S215 Wildland Urban Interface class. Uh, it was taught by Dave Reed. He's one of our former members. Um, and he went to South Metro, and it was, it was a tremendous class. He actually crafted the class, so we actually used a bunch of our maps and our data in the class versus the canned stuff. We got a lot of great feedback on that. Uh, we've been going to the old Marshdale Elementary School building for a lot of training for its demolition on the 18th. Evergreen Fire invited us down, and so we've been going down once or twice a week for that. We're setting up for 2023 with some new and exciting programs. We're going to be moving to Vector Solutions for an online training program. We'll help firefighters and EMS providers with training our tracking as well as offering a lot more online training. We'll allow volunteers to do more hands-on training when they're in the fire station. So essentially, the reason a lot of volunteer and career firefighter fire departments have gone to it. One of the big things it does for volunteers, it allows them to get a lot of classroom work out of the way online at their convenience. So when they're actually here in the fire station, we can do a lot more of that didactic hands-on stuff. Um, it also has a lot better training tracking so we can track all the hours a lot better. So for when people are um, renewing all their EMT certs, it actually talks to the state. So there's no longer the, the transmission, the, the transfer of hours from one program to another. So it should be a lot smoother. We're also looking at another staffing program. We had one a few years ago that was kind of clunky. Captain Weinfeld and Captain Yellen are working on it. And so that will handle all of our staffing, our volunteer and career staff from within the firehouse. Uh, volunteers can sign up for shifts and we can have this all set up so everybody can see kind of who's on shift. So if, if a volunteer is looking at coming on shift and there's already six people here, they'll probably look at a different ship. Um, or soon. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say that uh, that should be up and running by spring of 2023. We've also heard uh, Mr. Garrett Gutman from the position of firefighter paramedic. He's coming to us from Oklahoma. Um, he'll be starting work the 1st of January. We're still looking at the fire marshal job description between the three chiefs, and we should have that uh, job posted this month sometime. It's going to be a shared position between Elk Creek and Arcania and North Fork. 2022 is a great year for Elk Creek, and it's a pretty exciting time across the district with a lot of things, a lot of the projects we have. Operations, uh, we did have a low amount of staffing, volunteer staffing at the fire station, and that was because most of our active volunteers are already in EMT class. That's one night a week, then a Saturday, so you, that's, that's an awful lot every single week. Uh, we only had 165 hours of staffing. And that also is reflected in the uh, average three people per call. We didn't have any overlapping calls this month, and our response time is about normal. We didn't have anything out of the ordinary for calls, uh, one fire, and about everything else is right in track. Um, transports, same drill. Uh, we did have a tremendous amount of training that's due to the ENT class, as well as getting down to the, uh, the school. We've had a lot of people, and we've had to adjust our training nights because the guys in the ENT class are trying to get out too. So we're we're kind of adjusting that. And we're averaging 12, 13 people every time we go down there, which is pretty exciting. The 2023 Fire Academy, we've got 15 applications, and Captain Weinfeld is going through that right now. The uh, Joint Burn Building with Platte Canyon, the goal is to have that in service by spring of 2023. Um, there, I think boom day or crane day is the middle of January to set the second story on that. And then once that's together, we're going to start fabricating everything else. Um, we have our nine firefighters in the NT class. It's hosted by Inner Canyon, and they're expected to graduate by the end of the year. Vector Solutions, that's the online training program that we're using and the training in the Marshall Elementary School. Uh, fire prevention, I did find an error here. I apologize. It says February. Obviously, it was 20 inspections for the month of November, not February. That was my mistake. Um, kind of was reading, he had a couple of PTO days that he did. And as we did this year, we purchased those hybrid vehicles and it's worked out tremendous. Um, we're still averaging 30 from our, 35 miles to the gallon as opposed to the 11 that we were getting out of the Jeep. So it's, it's working a lot better. Fleet facilities, uh, we did do a little bit of work to one of our old Type 6 engines. We actually found a used flatbed and got it repainted and put that on it to kind of repurpose it. 
The other box, it was about 20 years old. We were starting to have some failures in the fiberglass and we were going to have to do something with it, but we already put a bunch of money in the engine. And so we decided we could just repurpose it at utility. So we put a few dollars in that. That's working out pretty well. We also, one of the last bits that we needed for fleet maintenance, um, the wish list that uh, Adam has was a tire mounting machine as well as a balancing machine. We started looking at what it cost and to get tires on an ambulance, it's about $550 in labor for all six tires to be mounted and balanced. We go through almost every ambulance every year. So that's three ambulances. Um, and then our utilities, you know, a couple more sets of tires. So we're spending about $1,800, $1,900 in labor. Started looking at tire mounted and balancing machines and they're about $4,000. So it really made sense. It was gonna pay for itself pretty quickly. So we did go ahead and purchase that. It's supposed to arrive sometime this week. Um, we did have another failure in the 1998 engine. Um, it says it's out of service. Adam got it fixed today. Uh, there was a fuel delivery issue. He had to replace the fuel pump and a bunch of other things, but it is a 1998 engine. Um, got a bunch of tires on uh, rigs. Uh, the new standard for NFPA is eight years now for the life of tires on fire engines. We had some that were aging out that were pushing. The prior standard was 10 years, and we had we were kind of pushing that. We had some that were 11 and 12. Um, you know, we don't put that many miles on them, but it's the time, and that's a recommendation, especially for steer tires. For having a 60,000-pound water tender, you don't want out-of-date tires. So we got those. Uh, we did have some heaters repair, repaired um, here as well as Station 4. We had some garage door issues, and we did purchase three new refrigerators for the uh, living quarters, and the vent for the range has been repaired for the third time. <laughs> um, and this is the breakover. If it breaks again, we're probably just going to replace it. Can I ask one quick question? Of course. Um, what's what would be the cap on the academy volunteer? Is, is like are we getting, yes. are we still getting a, fifteen? Seems like a good number, but well, out of those, the, those aren't the people we're necessarily taking. Those right. are the applications we've had. Right. We have people that may have pre-existing things that preclude them to be for being volunteers. Yeah. yeah. Um, ideally, we prioritize in district members. So I guess more I'm interested just in are we getting this kind of applications? You know, I understand we'll drop as we go, but are we are we seeing a drop in applications? That's yes, the main uh, yes. So significantly less significant. applications. Okay. Yeah, you know, we've done the usually go to the Red Rocks Career Day. We post it online, all that. Usually we have more applications. Uh, I was trying to look back. I mean, a lot of the time it's been open. We're we're at like. 30 some odd. Okay. Um, so yeah, we have had a drop in application. So we just are continuing to see the impact that's out there with the rest of the world. Correct. It's it's it's, it's tough. Uh, we are trying to, like I said, we are going to change kind of our model where not everybody has to be a firefighter EMT. We're going to try and change some of our model to attract some people for, you know, we are looking at a wildland only component. Um, we had a couple individuals who are interested in that, as well as an EMS only component, somebody who doesn't want to do fire. You know, sixty-two percent of our calls are EMS. So if we can help that. So we're we're trying to change some of our model and in, in becoming a more modern <coughs> volunteer fire department. Um I'll paint doors, stuff like that. Yeah, we can have a door painter, that'll be a position. We'll definitely take that. And uh, station three will be the first one. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's what I'm thinking about. Okay. So yeah, so volu so the applications are down. We're not looking at a cap yet. We we want to see how many viable volunteers we have and we'll dictate the cap off that. If if all 15 are great, we're gonna take all of them. Right. But we have some people that actually three of them turned in applications and then during their ride alongs, because we asked them to ride along, they said they're moving in three months. Somebody else is moving in six months. And we pointed out that maybe it's not worth investing for six yeah. months. Um, so those are some of the challenges. They got to ride. Here we go. Yeah. So thank you. That's that's what we needed. Any other questions of Chief Ware? Okay, Chief. Thank you very much for that report. I noticed that we did we did have just a mark a slight increase in in transport. So maybe we're making our way back up to maybe. As we've seen a downturn for what five years or more? Yeah. That, because transports are a money making endeavor for the fire department, correct? Yeah, they they are. I mean, we're still 
<laughs> yes, by all means, they should be if we get paid. I mean, yeah. we're right along the state average, about 40% collections. It's the same as every Firebase BMS system across the state. So, yes, we do make money, but does it pay for itself? No, the reality is it's not. It's, it's subsidized by taxpayers. It's, it's not a self-sustaining program. All right, that moves us to old business, and we will be addressing the 2023 budget adoption. There's three le resolutions tonight. One to adopt the budget, one to set the mill levies for 2023, and then one to um, appropriate the sums for the money of 2023. Um, Chief, did you want to just clarify each one of these resolutions, or um, would you... I'm thinking that uh, my fellow board members have had an opportunity to look at the budget. We know that uh, we discussed the budget last month, and um, the budget is a projection. It's not locked in, but it does keep Barb and the chief and uh, Chief Aronson and the firefighters with the goal in mind. And we saw what 2022's budget was, where they did a very good job, as uh, Director Woods has pointed out a number of times. And keeping that budget safe or keeping that budget realistic. Um, resolution for the adoption of the 23 budget is uh, basically that that uh, we, as a collective, the directors and the fire department, will work towards meeting that goal. Is that correct for a nice paraphrase? Chief? Yes, that, that sounds all right. Uh, so I would entertain a motion to adopt the resolution for the 2023 budget. Any one of my fellow board members want to make a motion to adopt the 2023 budget? I will make a motion to adopt the resolution to adopt the 2023 budget with the caveat that we correct the, I'm assuming this is right, the, the titles on the top of the resolution the 2023 budget. Yeah. Yep. Sorry, I should have got that earlier. I think we all should have, and um, point well taken. But I think we can just write that in and yeah. then move forward with the resolution. All right, so it should read resolution number 2023 12-3, correct? Oh, no, it's I, I see what you're saying. Resolution to adopt it would be 20 the 2023 20 budget. 1221. So it's the second line. 121. But it's 121. Oh, yeah, 121. I'm saying. All right. And so it's so it's just here in the budget in the title, yeah. not in the resolution. The resolution is correct. It's 2022 121. This is the first resolution of 12. Gotcha. Yeah. I see what you're saying. All right, so we have a motion to approve the budget for 2023 with the correction to adopt the 2023 budget on the header. Right. We need a second? Yes, we need a second. Second. A second by Ms. Melissa. And all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, and then I have these. Sorry, yeah, uh, right. So that passes unanimously. Thank you for catching that. All right, our second motion is the resolution to set the mill levies for 2023. Chief, did you want to clarify anything on that before we entertain a motion? No. Yeah. Right. Um, may I receive a motion to set the mill levies for 2023? By any one of my board members. So I would make a motion to set the mill, mill levy for 2023 for a resolution 2022 12 2. We have a motion. Second. And second. All right. All in favor? Aye. All right. That motion passes unanimously. And the last motion resolution to appropriate sums for the money 2023. Again, Chief, I'll give you the opportunity. Any discussion um, I uh, did, prior to? I did want to point out, so this is a little bit different than we did last year. Last year, it was just the budget number 
This year is everything, our reserves. Uh, the legal suggested we change that to include everything. That's why that number is 11 1 versus last year's when it was just that budget number. Uh, our legal counsel suggested adding that language because that actually inc incorporates all the dollars we have. If, if we do have to spend it, it it's appropriate and set up. So that's that's the only difference from last year. And that's why that number is smaller than last year. All right, Chief, thank you for the clarification. May I have a motion to approve or appropriate the sum for of money for 2023? Motion to appropriate the sums for 2023. Second, please. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. All right. So that moves us to the first item for old business. And all right, we'll move into the family program, opt-in, opt-out. You may remember last week, last month, in our meeting that we did address the need to make an announcement so that we would be voting on the Family Act tonight. The chief has, uh, I, I don't, please correct me if I'm wrong, chief, but you surveyed your employees. Correct. And they felt, felt as if that the Family Act was not as robust as the health care package that is being offered to the employee. Yeah. And felt that there was not a need for the department to engage in the uh, Family Act. Yeah, we so we sent the links out through that great website that I'm sure we've taken a look at. Um, we made a staff meeting to discuss it, and then we also did a survey monkey uh, just, yeah. just to make sure. Yeah. You know, I, I really don't. Obviously, if it's if people really feel it's a benefit, I, I think we should definitely do it. But it was unanimously, you know, that people didn't really think that it was going to benefit them. So that that was kind of where we were at with that. Um, you know, I did look at if we did opt in, it would cost us right around because I do believe if, if if the department chose to opt in, we should pick up the whole tab first. It's, it's not really a benefit if you're giving somebody a benefit and also a financial burden. So it would cost us right around $18,000, that was rough math. Um, and if we did decide to do that, we could take that out of our capital reserves. You know, So it, we, we do have that, it's not a financial constraint. Based on the feedback from the staff, I just, everybody said they don't feel it would be a benefit to them. Isn't it more of a catastrophic type benefit? In other words, it's not just, you know, you're, you're, you're sick for a few days. It's basically yeah, catastrophic. Right. Yeah, benefit. yeah. It's, it's more of a long-term, you know, three months, something like that. But we provide long-term disability to the staff. Yeah, long-term disability is covered through FPBA through our pension right. plan. You know, in the short term, up that first, like, six months, you know, our, our sick time, we actually give uh, 12 hours per month of sick time with a cap of 960 hours. We also have in our policies written that employees can donate sick time because you have people like all of us that never get sick. Mm -hmm. So with the approval of the chief, employees who never get sick, who have a heavy bank, can right. donate that to somebody who <clears throat> is sick. Uh, we've had it happen several times. And between donating PTO, because you can donate PTO as well, mm -hmm. between donating PTO and sick time, then we also have a light duty program. So if somebody, while well, they can't come back to full duty due to, you know, broken foot, something like that, we do have the ability to, for them to come back on the payroll and, and come back to work. So they're still at, at full pay. One other um, caveat to this whole thing, President Scott and I, uh, President Scott from the local and I sat through a brief presentation from um, an attorney that was addressing family issues. One thing that is an important piece is that even though the fire district will um, potentially opt out of the Family Act plan, anybody has the opportunity to enroll in the Family yeah. Act individually. So the resolution or the movement that we make tonight as a board does not preclude any one of the employees to Correct. choose to act upon their opportunity to engage in the Family Act. So, so sort of a follow-on question. So let's say that we have a firefighter who wants to opt in to this family plan, right? Do we, Elk Creek, then contribute our portion for that one individual? Yes. Okay, so the individual would be charged 
whatever the percentage is. 0. 0.49, I believe. 0. 0.49, okay. And we would match yes. that. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the potential of that happening, given the benefits that we already provide, probably is pretty slim. Very low from all the feedback. Like okay. I said, we we I talked to people individually. We talked about the staff. And I really wanted to make sure that, you know, the last thing I want to do is obviously opt out of something that would be a benefit to the employees. Right. Um, but yeah, that's correct. Very few people said that they were going to opt in, especially when we started pointing out, you know, the whole thing is if somebody wants to actually do it, they have to take care of it. It's not like our work comp. They have to do all the filing. They have to handle that. It doesn't get run through us, which that may as that may present other challenges down the road. It is a new program. Ironically enough, for us to opt out, we did find that it's still going to cost us money because the state has to evaluate our benefits package to make sure. Uh, and I think that's going to be five hundred dollars. I think that's that. Does that sound about right? Yeah. So the state has to evaluate our benefits package to make sure it's comparable to that, which is funny unto itself. And then we have we have to pay them. Yes. Them to do that. Yes, we have to pay it up. <laughs> of course. Okay. Any other discussion okay. about the family program, family act program? The only other thing I would add is that people can still opt into the federal level family act. Which is not well. paid, but it does have protections for the jobs, et cetera. So it's not, this doesn't preclude yeah. protections under the federal act that as well allow. So this was the state act moving in to make it paid, which is a federal is unpaid oftentimes. So, but thank you all for the discussion and the thought about it. That was my concern last time. I feel comfortable with your all's decisions. So, I would oh. make a new motion. Okay, go ahead. We're ready yes, that. yes, yeah. we are. Um, I would make a motion to uh, the resolution declining participation in the Colorado Paid Family and Medical Leave Act Insurance Program. The resolution 12 4. So, go ahead, everybody. Uh, uh, us, us, again, you want to read it because I didn't have the other insurance program. <laughs> uh, a motion uh, to accept the resolution declining participation in the Colorado Paid Family and Medical Leave Insurance Program, resolution number 2022 12 4. May I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, that passes unanimously as well. All right, thank you all. Um, that moves us into the outreach committee update. Cool. Uh, Grant, would you like to just this brief? I do, because it's exciting. Um, the website looks great. It's not ready for prime time. It's not ready for exposure. It's been really, it's it's quite a long ways down the road to being completely populated. Uh, we have some, we're kind of moving into uh, uh, checks and uh, quality assurances, and that's being done through some of our ambassadors and uh, Staff here in the in the fire department, um, and that you know is an important piece before it really gets out there, so that we make sure that the when we when we stand it up and make it available to the public, we have appropriate and accurate information on the website. It is looking fantastic, and uh, Trish has been doing great. Sharon put a lot of time into it, obviously, and um, really appreciate that. The rest of the firefighters, and I want to acknowledge that. Um, you know, this is on top of every all the other work that they do. So remember that they're out saving people's lives and property and doing all the other work that they're supposed to be doing. So it's it's great that we've got as far along as we've gotten and it's, um, it's looking good. And I'm excited to highlight it to the public when we're sort of anticipating launching it. I want to say January 17th is what we're sort of looking at and it will be put up at the same time Inner Canyon and their website goes up and they look uh, very nice together. They are well coordinated, which I think is an awesome aspect for it. So uh, apologize, we're not showing it. We're not trying to be sneaky. We're just, uh, it's important that we get, get things right in this process and along the way. And uh, Chuck and I have had an opportunity to you know, sort of review it and look at things as they've been coming along. And um, I'm, I'm just really pleased and again, want to thank those people who are doing the work on it because it's, um, it's going to be great. It's going to look good. Can I ask a question mm -hmm. then? Mm -hmm. Okay. I used to do software for a living. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we were also very 
proud of the things that we have done. Mm -hmm. But part of when it was in, before it was in production, when it was in development, we actually could demonstrate that to customers, which I would consider the people in this room kind of clients slash customers, to, to, to put holes in it. Okay, in other words, not to approve, disapprove, but to beta test it. To beta test it, yeah, to, to look at it. And so if you're talking about being in production on the 17th of January, wouldn't it make sense in the January board meeting to actually demonstrate that to the public so that the public can ask questions? I mean, that's who's going to be consuming that, who's the public, right? Yeah, that, we have a number of people whose eyes are on it and getting through it. And the other nice thing about this, never seen this it. website is it's that it's, it's correctionable. I mean, it, it'll be easily adapted there are more people than we've had in the department to be able to change it at this point and okay, that's that's not my usual mode of operation with new software so it's it's a new website it's um it's to be launched so can i just ask um so updates on a monthly basis who is managing that you know that's a good question and then um it's not it's not us, Chuck and I are <laughs> no. not our, It's not part of our role and responsibilities. Um, you know, but there are the, the the goal is to have one of I want to say four to five people in the department who are uh, trained to be able to uh, add in and up, make those updates and things okay. along the way. There is also a, a feedback loop in, built into the website so that people can get on and do a web form and. Um, move on and, and work with the adoptions and changes in the website. It's really a fluid website as far as the kind of changes that can be made. Okay. Um, and and having worked in one that's fairly similar to this, it's uh, you know even I can do those changes, which is a scary prospect. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think there will be a training aspect to this also, right, Sharon? So. Well, I think um, to entertain the board, might there be the opportunity to see just some of the uh, basics at the next meeting in January? Maybe not, not not for a beta test, but just to give us an idea of where we are. Why don't we, if, if we're at, if we're to that point, if we're not to that point, yeah, I think that would be the I think that would be appropriate, and we'll check in as we get closer to January, whatever our next meeting is, the second. Second um, the 12th, 12th, thank you. And if we're there, great. Now, one thing is that it gets, you know, we have to work with SIPA about when we launch these things. And SIPA only launches two times a month. Um, so, you know, we'd rather kind of get it going and get it up and then make corrections as we go along based on the feedback that we get through the work forms. Um, but if we can show it, on the ninth, um, I'll leave it to those who are building it and, and really looking into it to inform me about whether that is an appropriate time. I feel comfortable not, you know, with where we're at and how we're moving forward. And um, again, it's not a, an attempt to hide from anybody, or but it's not. Also, also don't awesome. want so many people's hands in it, and we have quite a few people really working on looking at it and making sure it's stood up in the way it should be. Well, this is exciting. I know that the outreach committee was um, stood up six months ago, five months ago, it wasn't that long ago. And we have already got to the point where we perhaps in half a year have a website that will help address some of the issues that were brought forth from our um, citizens in terms of ensuring that we had the, the recognition of uh, the efforts and the opportunities to provide resources to the, the um, the district and so I appreciate your efforts and I appreciate everybody else who's been involved with that and um, I'm excited and look forward to the point where we get to launch our new website. Any other questions for the outreach committee? All right, thank you very much. All right, Chief, would you like just to give us a brief um, consolidation committee report? Really not a whole lot to report. Um, the survey is out there. 
they did send us an email that they're well over a thousand uh, responses. They haven't even started any data analysis, obviously anything like that. So it's just kind of status quo. It's in a holding pattern. Um, the committee will probably meet. Uh, it, you know, it closes next week, and then they start doing their stuff. I am obviously not a data scientist. I don't know how long any of that stuff takes. Once they start crunching the numbers, that's when the committee will probably get back together, and then honestly, that's what's going to guide our next steps. Um, and just a, a request for okay. everyone here, if you would continue to push out the link to the survey so that we can get as much information as possible. That's an important piece that um, was created by the committee to ensure that we allocated enough time to get the appropriate amount of responses. One interesting fact though, is Magellan said that to get the amount of information that they felt appropriate or the minimum amount was 400 responses. Is yes. that correct? Something like that. It's, it's you remember data that? science and stuff that I, I don't understand. Yeah. There, there's a certain metric. Yeah, yeah. The, 400. <clears throat> yeah. but to 400 the minimum. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, so, uh, so we have doubled almost, uh, um, tripled that. So yeah. I'm, I'm excited that we're getting to the point that we might actually have 1,200 responses. And hopefully we'll have, you know, and then, then we'll have the metrics and see. I mean, if, if if we move forward, if we don't, whatever. I mean, this this is the first time we've ever done anything like this. And I think the feedback from the public and the taxpayers is huge. Um, we are going to put, you know, do another big push over the weekend via social media, email channels, and that sort of thing, to see if we can get a little bit more. And so we'll Because it closes on the 14th. Correct. So, yeah. So make sure you're clear that it's the 14th. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're going to try and hammer at home via social media and whatnot to really push it out there. Hopefully, uh, we'll see if we get another bump in responses. Yeah, it gets hard when people say the wind's broken and it's because it's close. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. All right. That takes us out of old business into new business. Any new business from the board? Hearing none, we will move into citizens issue. Any issues from um, our citizens? Sure. I got a couple things. Um, so I was preparing budget to uh, to the audits um, in the last little while, and even it looks like the chart of accounts has, has changed in the last couple of years. So we, so they they don't all um, match up very well, but the budget. The, the budget 21 final that you're working on doesn't match the audit for the 21. Um, might I ask the areas. Uh, the so key for Ms. Barr, the, you, can you specifically point out the areas of um, issue? Okay. Um, so in the 21 audit, it's uh, it shows about 5.5 million in revenue. And the 21 final on this budget sheet you're working on, it shows about 4.3 million in revenue. So that's a pretty glaring error. That's a, I see 5.5. Yeah. You must have an old. It's just, I don't know why. Excuse me. Under it. No, no. Um, so this, this is the one that we were working with today. Okay. And there is a budget of 5.5. Okay. All right. That's so good. Um, Apologies for having provided you or how you got the, the old one. Okay, well, I, I can compare this to that. I'll, I'll do that at a later date. Um, <clears throat> let's see, another thing I was looking at was basically this chart of accounts. I can't, you know, I can't tell exactly. Things get moved around. It looks like to me that where there's a lot of admin stuff that. In the in the audits, it's listed as something else. In the audit and the and the, and the uh, budget chart of accounts is, is difficult to, to to match up because I don't know what they're really auditing. And the numbers they don't it's not like they use the same chart of accounts to do the audit, so it's really difficult to to put certain things together. Obviously. Income and total income, total expenditure were pretty easy to find. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and look over this and get back to you on that. Uh, I also had some some uh, 
input on this uh, Triton report, which is, is kind of strange to me that that uh, this Triton report has capital outlay. I don't know if you've been over this thing. It has um, 21 budget, 320,000 for Elk Creek, uh, 22 projected, and on, it just says 5,000 for capital outlay. And that doesn't seem like that's even reasonable. Chief, do you and you got about 900, it's 900 and 945,000 budgeted for 22 on capital outlays. Um, I'd have to look at the trade report to see. We did have some errors in the trade report. Uh, the trade report was completed, I believe, in 21. So if a lot of things for 22 may not have been done, I'll have to take a look at that and see exactly what you're talking about. Well, capital outlay 5,000 a year after this year is just kind of unreasonable. I mean, I don't know. That's a, such a glaring, obvious thing in this report that we look into. Um, let's see what else we got here. Oh, and the uh, transparency notice is out of date on the website. So that needs to be up to date. It yep. doesn't show the next, doesn't even show when the next election will be it's coming up. In May. May. Uh, in another, yeah, a few months. So that's all I got right now. But I think somebody really needs to look into these, the chart of Canada. I don't know what the bookkeeping software we use here anymore. Sage. Sage, mm -hmm. and and we have a chart of yeah. Can I get it? There is a chart of Sage. Yes. I really love to see uh, your uh, your report too, with all your life Sure. Chart. Um. Yeah. That because you're looking at like summary level information, right? So this is not chart of accounts. Right. There are accounts that roll up into each of these summary right. levels. So I guess I, I'm not sure I understand your question. I'd like to see the chart of accounts. Is that something that we needs to do a formal request on? I don't know. Um, can we get your contact information and follow back up with you once uh, yeah. we've had an opportunity to kind of digest this? Yeah, no problem. All right, and you can hook up with me or the chief afterwards. Sure. Thank you. What was your name again, sir? Michael Bartlett. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. All right. Um, moving. Yes, Neil. Well, I have a general question on the um, understanding the CERT reimbursement and the CERT expenses okay. lines. And uh, is the CERT, I guess my ultimate question is. <clears throat> How much money does the Elk Creek make in terms of um, the CERT program beyond the reimbursements? And I can understand different things. You travel to California and you get um, a tank full of diesel, um, and that's a charge and that's reimbursed. And then you have the labor, of especially the staff members that would have been paid otherwise. And then you have day rates for, say, I three engines and that. There, there's actually a website, Neil, that says how the state pays for what. Yeah, but the question is, how much? I know that. I understand that. Okay. So they pay hundred nine dollars an hour for a I three engine, and then they cut it off after eight hours. So the question is, otherwise, if we didn't go out on the. Uh, a certain thing, it would be sitting in the garage making zero. So, um, okay. is, there, is there an actual amount, a way of getting that to say how much beyond expenses that are given that we actually get? Because I don't believe we'd be doing that if we were losing money. Correct. I, I can touch on that, Neil. And that would be much more useful in the revenues to. Compare real revenues. <laughs> of course. So essentially, what we it's, it's right around 23% is what we get after the reimbursement. After all that, you know, it, it ebbs and flows depending on the assignment, depending on what they're doing. Right around 23% of that is what we end up. Now, the other 
I'm not going to say intangible component is when somebody goes out on a fire assignment, they're taken off our books. So we're not paying their labor. Mm -hmm. So we end up saving a tremendous amount of money on labor. And that's, that's a, that's a hard tangent. It, it's a hard number to extrapolate out. So if, for instance, Lieutenant Scott goes out on a fire assignment and he's gone for 21 days, we're not paying his labor for 21 days. The incident is paying for him and they're also paying for his backfill. So all the overtime to cover his shift is being paid for by that incident. So that's kind of that. That's a rough number to pull out. Our, our rough number metric is right around 20, you know, 22%, 23%-ish. Um, and then labor-wise, we've tried to, it, that's really hard to extrapolate out. Well, wouldn't it be more useful if you're looking for a no levy increase to, to present your actual amount of revenue than a higher amount of revenue? Our, I really feel it's not really, it's got expenses in there that is really not what I consider revenue. That's that's correct. And so it it would be more in line where you could have an asterisk and say, well, here's what we got reimbursed, but we did come out ahead on all of this. Of and course. How much we came ahead and that, that would be a more realistic number to report and even to say, well, it's not exactly right, but it's pretty close to being right. It's much more right than being reported. In, in the reason we started doing that is just with that reimbursement line, that was something that came out of, I believe, an audit a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. just, just with some of that track. And that's why we started doing that. Um, and we can definitely look at that and have that number. I'm sure Director Woods would be able to, we could probably figure that out pretty easily. It would just, it would, it would take some math on that. But I would think that in the process of asking for mill at the increases that people would be really interested to know, well, just how much of course. are we making? And yeah. that, this is a question to, in advance of a mill levy seeking process to say, here's a question people will be asked. Most definitely. Yeah. We can put that on our to-do list, Chief. And I have another question here. Um, on the consolidation survey, there was a question that, or a statement about a single dispatch system would help um, the response time here. And um, I just wondered what is a single dispatch system and how does that relate to JeffCom? And would that be somebody that would be standing by quoted the radio uh, as an internal dispatcher within a consolidated district, or would that be a position at JeffCom? Or would that be somehow, and I would think somebody was aware of that sort of a dispatcher for our own three, the previously three um, independent uh, fire districts? In that, uh, that question, the single dispatch system has. Many people point out we already have that. But with, with that question, what we were hoping to articulate more with that question is to erasing the individual toning of the districts. You know, it would still be the same dispatcher, but instead of toning, for instance, we just went to mutual aid structure fire at Evergreen. We monitor Evergreen. We were well aware of it. We were already leaning forward, walking to the trucks when they were going that way because we knew it was going. But if we weren't leaning that way, if we weren't listening to it, that would already put that out, you know, several minutes. It would take people to get the time on scene. And then we would get then Evergreen gets dispatched, they get somebody on scene. By the time they get a size up, then they call dispatch and say, you know, please order Evergreen or Elk Creek, whatever for a mutual aid. So it's trying to alleviate that, that right there. So it's not a single dispatch system per se, but a single by toning out a single department, you're going to have a lot more people leaning forward instead of having to go for each individual department. And that 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 question, unfortunately, was not articulated very well with that. Okay. I have one more other question, sort of a general question. How is inflation impacting the, uh, in a general sense, the the strength of the budget process? Are we and what is your general opinion? And so are we in effect uh, having a lower budget because we only have nine tenths of a dollar? So in 
and uh, and then which also leads into any no levy increase. Is that just going to be accounting for inflation? We're just going to be more or less staying in place with a no levy increase and not developing ourselves further. And sort of also, in your opinion, what is inflation and the firefighting business? <laughs> and is it most people have this, oh, we've lost 10% of something and possibly more. And our, our is inflation in terms of uh, expensive ambulances or <laughs> engines much more than 10%. I can I can definitely get on that. We are looking at we do need another ambulance for next year. We budgeted three hundred for it, and I just got off the phone with the vendor, and he said, "So you guys are going light." The last ambulance we bought was, I think I, I believe it's a twenty, and it was two sixty eight right below two seventy. And the last vendor we talked to for about the same spec, we're pushing closer to three fifty. Uh, fire engines right now. Talking to a vendor and the same pumper we bought in 2014 for seven, I think it was 745, somewhere around there, just right around there, is now just below a million dollars. Um, so, I mean, these are the big ticket things. Obviously, the little things are going up, you know, uniforms, everything else. Yeah, I mean, inflation is impacting us. We've tried to be very frugal with everything, but I, I do believe inflation is going to be a thing. You know, people have pointed out, you know, our big carryover. What we're looking at is, you know, with interest rates going up, we've tried to save enough money. We do need another fire engine. And we save enough money where we can hopefully pay cash for it so we don't have to deal with the interest rates right now because that's another aspect of it. With everything coming up next year, we are going to have some big expenses. You know, a 25-year-old fire engine is not ideal for a first-out fire engine. And inflation is definitely a thing. You know, in keeping with this, depending on what we do, the survey is going to have a big it's going to dictate a lot of what we do, that, that information. You know, we have to stabilize our mill levy. We have that sunsetting mill levy that we have to deal with. Um, and then from, you know, depending on what the survey says, that so all those questions, you know, there was a 16 mill, the 14 mills, and if you answered no on all those, it brought all the way down to, you know, what we have now, 1253. And if, it, if people think that's appropriate. Um, so a lot of it's going to be dictated on what all the survey and what our taxpayers say. But yes, inflation is definitely... Uh, it's going to be a thing moving forward. Um, I know Inner Canyon, they originally on their new station project, when they first started this, I think three years ago, they were looking at two stations for right around 5.5 million. And of course, they started this in one of the worst building times and modern times. Now they're looking at one station for six and a half. And so we have some significant infrastructure improvements we need, and we're looking at it for, you know, it's going to be expensive to build. <laughs> so inflation is definitely something that we have. And, you know, it, it, it's hard to say where this goes next year. You know, as, as we start looking at it, we are going to have to buy some big things and they are going to be expensive. And they're getting exponentially more expensive than when they were five years ago. So inflation is definitely going to have an effect on us. Thank you for those questions, Neil. <laughs> So I, as I was doing the survey, the thing that I thought about was the fact that, you know, there's a number of us citizens that sort of really track and know what's going on and, and probably need to know more as we go forward with the consolidation to be able to talk to our neighbors about why this is good. I I couldn't figure it out from reading both the report and doing the survey questions, those benefits, so I can describe them to my neighbor. So that that is gonna have to be something- Correct. We're gonna have to understand pretty darn well right. to, to go forward. And you know? that's that's one of the things that the survey company, yet again, I am definitely not a data analyst. I don't know anything about this. I learned more from sitting down with those people for an hour than I've ever known in my life. It, it's, it's a whole different science. They wanted the survey just to see where people stood cold. And they said, you know, obviously, if the survey is not in favor of any of it, that's it. You know, you can stop working on it now and move forward in a different direction. If people are in favor, it, then start working towards, you know, getting pros and cons and building all that out. But what they said is, you know, you have to know what people say before you really go crazy with it. So that, that's kind of where that's at. You know, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, they'll start analyzing it and we'll get a bunch of data out of it. And, 
Because I mean, the pros and cons are really important. I've had a lot of people ask me, and that's 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 huge. You know, there are people saying it's a thinly veiled attempt at a mill levy increase, but that that's why the questions are there. You know, the the consolidation shouldn't depend on a mill levy lift. <clears throat> the consolidation is about service to the taxpayers, and if nobody wants a mill levy lift, it would be ridiculous to try and go for a mill levy lift. You know, that's that's one of the big things we're going to get out there, depending on what all this says. Yeah, and my comment, and you'll see it in there, was, you know, I went through, I said, I could support a mill levy, but I don't understand of course. what benefit this district is going to get. Yeah. It's the biggest district. It's probably going to be pulled by the other two. This is just me thinking. Yeah. And you look at places like Summit County, who've been consolidating for the last 20 years. <laughs> I mean, constantly. Yeah, and they're about now, I think, about the same size as this consolidation is going to be. So, how did they do it? How did you know yep. those kinds of things would be beneficial to to us, the yeah. people that are your proponents, and you know, with the citizens. So, and that's I'm like just I, putting it out there. No, I really appreciate that, and that's really what we're looking at doing. The whole thing is with this survey, see where people stand, and if even people are remotely positive, we're going to go. You know, we'll have pros and cons, and all of that set up. Okay. And I mean, it's it's this sounds silly, but this is something that's one hundred percent driven by what. The taxpayers say what the results of the survey yeah the, and by that i mean the results of the survey that's why we did all this you know right. and that's why we're reaching out and that's why we hired the company is because they're a professional company they have a, a much better reach than that's what they do i i got all that i've been watching so i say once we get somewhere oh yeah i really need to understand this because i couldn't figure it out in the survey or the yeah survey. and that that's a great point and i appreciate that mm -hmm. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Um, so I do have a couple of things. You might have covered um, most of it on the mill levy. I just want to make sure I got the sequence of events kind of of right. So, you know, last boarding meeting and just a minute ago, you said the, 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 the consolidation shouldn't rest on a mill levy or should not require a mill levy. What's the right terminology? Well, the, the consolidation... We can still consolidate at our mill rate. Right. The consolidation is not resting on a mill increase. Okay. And that's essentially how the report is written too, right? Yeah. It's, it's based on current mill levies in each district. Of course. Yeah. So, and so the, the gist of it is in the report, if you read the report, the first thing is the inclusion and extension, right. which we all agree was a terrible idea that if all the fire departments get together and decide, oh, we, your fire department's gone. Now you have a new one. Legally, we can do that. That was the first recommendation of the report. We all decided that that's probably, if, if you want to erode any trust that taxpayers have, is to not ask for any input, yeah. just do that. And that would be to the lowest mill levy. Mm -hmm. Because one of the big things in a consolidation is you have to have the same mill levy if it's a consolidated fire department. If it moves to a fire authority, then you can have the individual mill levies across the district. And most of our mill levies are within you know several points. It's not that far out of line. Okay, and so then we've got a, a vote in 2023 on the mill levy, and so then what I'm assuming is the amount of that mill levy vote 2023, is that then going to be determined in part by your survey results? Uh, How are we going to get to that number? Uh, yes, yes, yes and no. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, yes and no. So our, our, we have a mill levy that's sunsetting. Uh, we've been going back and forth on legal. Luckily, Director Newby has been Pushing that hard, and our what's what essentially our legal counsel said was the uh, language in the ballot initiative in 2013 was awful. Uh, it's extremely confusing. It actually contradicts itself. It says that it's good for 10 years, and it ends at the end of 24. But the Tabor language is you start collecting it in 13, and our legal counsel, they were not our legal counsel at the time. They were not amused by it. They they said it it was. I mean, when you pick it apart, it is very confusing. Essentially, yes, we are going to have to do, uh, we're going to have to stabilize our mill levy to erase that sunset in 23. If that's part of a consolidation, you know, then that will roll into that. If not, it'll be a standalone election just to stabilize our mill levy, okay. you know, in 23. And what that is, it's, it's going to be reaching out to erase the sunset. Yeah, we had a 10 year sunset on the one we got in 2013. Um, and we've been going back and forth with legal. They actually had to, we just got some voices. I'm sure you saw it. They had to actually have a conference. And essentially what they ended up doing is relying on Tabor. You know, the bottom line of Tabor is to limit government growth. And so the backbone of that 
will be, um, our legal counsel said the fallback will be, they'll be falling back to Tabor on that. And they'll err on the side of Tabor, which means 23, even though the language sort of says 24, but it also says 23, it's very clunky. So we are going to have to address that in 23. Okay. And then, so I kind of go back to the other part. So the amount that we raise the mill levy, there's the sunset piece. Yeah. Then is there then a potentially incremental piece for consolidation? That all depends on what the service is. Yeah. Yes. All this is going to be driven by, you know, we, it's, it's all going to be driven by what the taxpayers say. Okay. You know, it's, it's, uh, as, as Dr. Whitehead pointed out, inflation is a real thing. You know, if you look at a fire department as a business model, it's probably one of the worst business models ever because you can't increase your rates based on inflation. You know, a house painter, a carpenter, any other business out there, you can increase your rates. As inflation goes up, fuel prices, you can increase your rates. We we don't. We operate the same way. So tentatively right now, we're in a holding pattern to see what kind of that's going to bring. But we will have, you know, we did budget for several elections next year, and we are planning on having something on the ballot in November, whether consolidation, stabilization in the middle levy, uh, a combination of the two. So Chief, just just to clarify the sunsetting mill levy, <clears throat> we will be able to collect through 2023. Yes. And then 31 December, it stops if we don't do something. Correct. Yes, that was our, that was the final after back and forth, okay. you know, I told you I went to face face in the county. We, right. we did a lot, and there there was a lot, and everybody agreed that the language is not great. And that's that's essentially the bottom line. We just got that, and you know, that's what it is. Yeah. So yeah. that's what we're going to address, and that's what we're going to tackle. All right, great. Thank you. Just one other question. Um, so again, kind of going the survey kind of forced me or got me to go back and actually wade through the report. <laughs> um, looking at the report, it, you know, there's what I would kind of call some operational aspects. You know, where are the people going to be? Where are the stations going to be? What's going to be open? What's going to be closed? You know, as you said, that was done a couple of years ago or a year and a half, a year or so ago. As you guys are going through this process now, is there an operational plan that says, you know, takes the framework of, you know, let's say what was in the report and then you and the mm -hmm. other chiefs looking at this and saying, okay, this is how it might actually look. Where does that piece stand? We've been tinkering with it unofficially. We're, yet again, we're waiting till that survey piece comes back to see if we really need to march forward with it. Essentially, you know, there will be nothing being closed. We will never close fire stations. That was something that was talked about in the past. It doesn't make any sense for us to close a fire station. You know, a volunteer fire station, it doesn't take much to operate. And land is so valuable up here, it makes zero sense for us to close a fire station and sell the piece of dirt because we'll never be able to afford another one. So we'll never close any of the stations. I know all the chiefs, you know, that's not going to happen. What we're probably going to do is look at heat maps. So based on the heat maps of where our calls are, and then start looking at, you know, how the staffing and what the operations are going to look like. Um, but nothing, nothing is nothing more than copy, you know, talk over copy yet, just because we don't know wh where we're going with it. All right. So it sounds like once you finally get the data churned yeah. from this company, then you're really going to be in a position to start flushing out. The then we're going to start moving things. forward with all that. You know, we're going to start bringing all this out, looking at operational plans, looking at, you know, how resources are going to be allocated. And that's one of the reasons, you know, in the budget we have such a large carryover is with all these things going, we originally planned to buy a fire engine this year. But with the possibility of a consolidation, some of the agencies have vehicles with much less miles than we do. So we can allocate, you know, we may not have to buy a fire engine because there's one with a lot less miles that we can put into a frontline engine. Um, and by the same token, if nothing works and the taxpayers don't want to extend our sunset, you know, we that's that's another thing we're thinking about. So there's a lot of bits moving with it. But yeah, so probably the first of the year we're gonna start really hashing a lot of it out. All right, great. Thank you. Though that answers my question. I think maybe that hit on something that Joe said, you know, just you know, should the decision be made to get forward? I mean, we are here to yeah. help distribute get factual information. Of course. And one of the other things to think about is even if it does, so it goes on the, uh, you know, the ballot in November passes. It's not like you wake up December 1 and it's a whole new thing. The reality is it's probably going to take a good year 
to really, you know, I mean, on paper, yes, but all the operational changes and all, it's, it's going to take quite a while. It's not going to happen overnight. Thank you. Well, I would speak on behalf of my board. And I, I just want to let you guys know how much we appreciate not only your interest, but the fact that you continue to advocate for what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, and the things that you say are heard and we do discuss those while we think about our next steps and next board meetings, the things are going to move forward. So um, it, it, it's a heartfelt thanks to all that um, that silently help, that are um, that are vocally out here every day trying to ensure that we're getting the things done that are necessary for to really to provide a service that will that will help our community. That's the goal. That's the reason why my fellow board members and I are up here is to ensure that this fire department is doing the best it can to our neighbors and you are um, safe as possibly can be. So, um, all right. Any other questions from, yes, sir? One more thing. So I was reading that training report today and it, it listed, you know, I was reading about our fire station. It listed basically station three, which goes off the hill as not even useful for anything except for radio equipment. And then station two, it listed it as as not really a fire station, like it only has an interface engine and no ambulance in it. And I'm wondering if that classification of that fire station is affecting the ISO because they're not really within five miles of real fire station. Um, that classification is an error. They do have pumpers at them. They have engines as well as tenders. That was one of the errors in the report. Um, now, of course, we still have pumpers and tenders at our station. Um, yeah, the, the classification and where that was going, that came from the consultant. He He visited the station and he decided that was their their idea based on the call volume on top of Conifer Mountain, as well as the response out of the station. Their original recommendation is several of our fire stations should be closed, which we... Well, I'm thinking that this fire station probably encompasses all Conifer Mountain within five miles. But the station, station two out there at five, if that doesn't have the right equipment in it, then those ISOs go way up. There... Correct. That's true, but it does. Okay. Yeah, right. that's well. Reports an error. I that's yes. An error. We are aware of that. Yeah, we I had should be corrected. <laughs> the the report. So the reporting company they wanted to get paid, and towards the end of it, there were some errors, and we all knew about it, and we just wanted to complete it. You know, we are aware of those errors, and that was yet again the recommendation of the consultant that he saw no reason for station three. We strongly disagreed, and we agreed to disagree, and called it good because those are fire stations, and they are critically important for right. our operation. I agree. Yeah, cool. Oh, yeah. Anything else? All right. Well, with that, I'll entertain a motion for adjournment at seven oh seven nineteen. Motion to adjourn. Second the motion to adjourn. All in favor. Bye. All right. Merry Christmas, everybody. We will Merry see Christmas. you in 2023. <laughs>